Chapter 16, Another Circle in Salem. You'd best put another plate on the board, Susanna. I see my husband has brought company for supper again. Elizabeth Putnam held five-month-old Mary on her shoulder as she turned from the hearth to peer out the window, kitchen window toward the barnyard. It was a fine day in late May. Beyond the open kitchen door, all the world beckoned, alive with the scents and sounds of an afternoon in late spring. The mellow light of sunset bathed the door frame. Now whom has he brought this time? Elizabeth asked. But I picked up the note of bemused fondness in her voice. For in the month that Mary and I had been living with the Putnams, we had learned that Elizabeth and Joseph loved each other very much, and their caring devotion extended to all those they welcomed into their home. Elizabeth patted baby Mary as we watched Joseph and another man, deep in conversation, walk their horses slowly toward the barn. Then she smiled at me. It's Jonathan Hawthorne. You best go change that collar. The baby has spit up on you. I ran upstairs to do her bidding. My heart was beating very fast, as it did every time I saw Jonathan, although he had come to call often in the time I'd been here. As had Thomas Hitchborn, the Putnams had welcomed both young men and given Mary and I our privacy with our suitors. The room Mary and I shared was on the second floor, across from Joseph and Elizabeth's. Indeed, they had done their utmost to make us feel like kin. I had many bitter moments when I warned, warned Mama, who was still in Salem prison, and though we didn't know where Father was, though matters in our own community were moving swiftly toward even greater turmoil. In this sturdy three-story house, we felt protected. We were assigned no real duties, but I quickly took stock when we arrived and determined that since the house was large and they only had two indentured servants, the house girl and her husband, and there was a new baby to care for, Elizabeth could use our help. So I set about assisting her with the child and Mary helped with the sewing and cooking. I was most pleased, of course, to discover that my original impressions of Joseph Putnam had been correct. He was not only a mixture of sober strength and boyish eagerness, but he was gentle with his wife and baby, caring for his neighbors and quick to enjoy a good joke. He behaved toward us in the manner of an older brother. Elizabeth, meanwhile, took the role of an older sister, glad to have two females about who were not servants and in whom she could confide her secret joys and fears. Mama had been right in wanting us here, I decided. I changed my collar and brushed my hair. In the time I had been here, I discovered something else that warmed my heart. Joseph Putnam was emerging as the leader of a new circle in Salem. The circle, as I perceived it, was composed of people who knocked on his door in the middle of the night, who sat with Joseph by candlelight in his library, talking until dawn, when they appeared at the board for breakfast. Others rode to his place to talk with him in the barn, while their wives came and sat midday to speak with Elizabeth. These were people like Reverend Jonathan Hale from Beverly and the kinsman of Rebecca Nurse and Thomas Mall, a Quaker, who held with the belief that the witchcraft business had started from petty hatreds in the neighborhood. Some were people who had once come to Mama's shop, like Reverend Wise of Ispwich, who had spoken in behalf of John Proctor and Reverend Francis Dane of Andover, who was trying to caution his flock about the witch panic. And there were others who corresponded from Boston. One name I had come to know was Thomas Brattle, a merchant and learned learn mathematician who was about to be named treasurer of Harvard College. Another was Robert Khalif, a merchant friend of Brattle's who was equally outspoken against witchcraft. I sensed, though Joseph had not actually told me, that these people were all working quietly in the background, waiting for the right moment to step forward and take a stand. Every Monday morning, Joseph took us to visit Mama in Salem Prison. We were allowed only one visit a week by the authorities, but Mary and I made the best of it. Mary cooked delicacies to bring. I took bundles of clean clothing. We knew Mama shared the food, but we did not chide her. In prison with her were Sarah Morey, Lydia Dustin, Susanna Martin, and Dorcas Hoare, along with Margaret Jacobs and Mary Etsy. While we visited with Mama, Joseph visited with the male prisoners. When we took our leave, he paid the jailer two shillings and sixpence, which was Mama's board for the week. Father had left money with him for this purpose and any other concerning our family. If Joseph knew where father was, he did not divulge this fact to us. And Mary and I agreed we would not badger him to tell us. And so the weeks of May went by. Many times, sensing that Joseph and Elizabeth were working as leaders of this new circle, I had considered coming forth and telling them what I knew. Then I thought of Mary Warren, who had tried to recant her testimony. I pondered how the magistrates had badgered her. Finally, she broke 
denying that her original testimony had been false. She started talking about shapes hovering over her again. The magistrates were happy. They announced that she was cleansed of her sin and rejoined the circle. So then who would believe me? Joseph and Elizabeth, yes, but father was still in danger. The magistrates had widened their search for him to include Boston, and there was Mary to think about. I did not care for myself, but I could not risk the girls crying out on Mary, let alone Brother William when he returned, so I kept my silence. The time for speaking out would come, I told myself, and when it did come, I would know it. We were at the Putnams only two days when I learned something else about them. One morning, I had gone to the hen house to collect eggs so Mary could make breakfast. As I passed the barn, I looked in the open door and saw the horses fully saddled in their stalls. Judd must have forgotten to unsaddle the horses, I said to Ellen, their maid servant, as I handed the eggs to Mary and took my seat at the table. From across the table, Joseph frowned and sipped his morning brew. When Ellen left the room, he looked at me and Mary. Girls, I must tell you this, but you must keep it quiet. Can you? We both assented. Have I done something to displease you, sir? I asked. He looked so solemn. He smiled. You can call me Joseph, both of you. We must be friends with no secrets between us. We must trust one another in this house, for our safety depends one upon the other. We must have no secrets. Those words were like a kneel in my bones. Yes, Joseph, I said. I keep my horses saddled at all times, and we have bags packed. It would please me if you would both pack bags and leave them by your bedsides. Elizabeth is able to use a firearm. Are either of you? I stared at place at sweet Elizabeth. She smiled back. No, I said numbly. Mary shook her head and stared at him wide-eyed. I shall teach you both. Has it come to this then? I asked. Mayhap it will. Being related to my brother serves me no longer. I've alienated us from the authorities by the stand I took. If we are accused, we intend to flee in the night, and you will both come with us. Yes, Joseph, I said. I tied a ribbon in my hair, blue. It had come from Mama's shop. I went back downstairs. In the kitchen, Jonathan had seated at the table with Joseph and Elizabeth. Hello, Susanna, he said. He and Joseph had been deep in conversation. No doubt, Jonathan appreciated the older cousin he had in Joseph. For though he still lived under his father's roof, the elder Hawthorne had all but disowned him, and it pained Jonathan greatly. We listened as the two men told of how Mary Etsy, who had been released from prison earlier this month for lack of evidence, was again arrested. Mercy Lewis had taken ill and said that she saw Mary's shape hovering over her. Of course, Joseph said dryly, my niece and Abigail Williams were at Mercy's bedside seeing the shape also. Elizabeth lighted candles on the table. They cast long flickering shadows and I grew dismayed. We ate for a moment in silence, then Joseph laughed. They brought John Alden to court this afternoon, Elizabeth. John Alden, firstborn of John and Priscilla of Plymouth Colony, was a well-known sea captain, soldier, and Indian fighter, and a friend of Joseph's. He strode into the courtroom, Joseph recounted, and when the girls fell into fits, he said they were doing juggling tricks. He called them Salem wenches. Bartholomew Gendy was sitting on the bench with the other magistrates. He almost laughed when the girls accused Alden of selling powder and shot to the Indians and having Indian papooses. Gedney said that if such practices make a man a witch, half the men of Massachusetts Bay Colony could be so accused. He laughed again, but Elizabeth was solemn. What happened to John Alden? she asked. Joseph sobered. I don't think for one God-given moment that Gedney believed the charges, but the others did, and he gave in to them. Alden was taken away, calling the girls liars. He's posted bail and is in his own home under guard. He's a brave man, said Elizabeth, but bravery does not in that court. We'll stand behind him, Elizabeth, dear, but now I have other news. Last week, the frigate Nonsuch put in at Boston Harbor. Increase Mather has returned with our new charter and with our new royal governor, Sir Williams Pipps. Everyone asked about the charter and what Joseph had heard of it. We will still be allowed to elect our own representatives to the General Court of Massachusetts Bay Colony, he told us, and all our land titles have been reinstated. But hear this. The electorate is not limited to members of the covenant. Those Puritans who considered this salvation secure, anyone from any Christian sect may be elected. Can you believe this? Susanna and Mary, your father will be pleased. He's always wanted something like this, I agreed. Joseph laughed and slapped his knee. The damned can rule. Oh, I tell you, Mather and Pips have their, will have their troubles now. The Puritans will have difficulty accepting this. 
tell me of this Pips, Elizabeth insisted. Is he the same who was born on that rude plantation on the river Kennebec in Maine? The same, Joseph said. His father was a gunsmith. His mother gave birth to 26 children. He's the one who built a ship when he was 21 and sailed off to the Bahamas to retrieve that sunken treasure from a Spanish galleon, bushels and bushels of pieces of eight. He turned to Mary and me explaining. He took it to England and he was knighted. He could have lived there in high style, but he's a New Englander at heart. Always he pushed the king for restoration of our rights. He was named the new royal governor when he helped Mather secure our new charter at the court of King William. Which side will he take about witchcraft? Elizabeth mused. Elizabeth, my dear, when a man grows up in the wilds of Maine, where the wind crackles in the trees at night and the wolves are thicker than they are here, where the deaths of infants and livestock are wrought as if by unseen hands, he believes in witches, Joseph told her. Oh, Elizabeth said sadly. Yes. Joseph refilled his mug. Maine does something to a man's soul. So when Sir William Pipps was told that witches have broken out all over the place, he believed the story. And besides, Jonathan added, he has sailed the Spanish main and heard all the fanciful tales of the devil and sea monsters. You two certainly are cheerful this evening, Elizabeth remarked. My dear, we tell the truth. Pips will do his duty. They say he is setting up a court to try the accused. It will be called the Court of Oyer and Terminire. They sit on June the 2nd. From whence the name? Elizabeth asked. It means to hear and determine, Joseph explained. And who, Elizabeth persisted, will hear and determine about our accused friends and neighbors? Bartholomew Gidney from Salem, Sam Sewell, John Richards, William Sargent, and Waite Winthrop from Boston, Nathaniel Stallenstall from Haverville. The presiding justice will be Deputy Governor Stratton. And Governor Pipps? Elizabeth asked. Sir William has assigned himself a safer mission, Joseph reported. He has gone off to fight Indians. Joseph summoned me and Mary into his library after supper. First, you and Jonathan may have the company room again this evening, as I have given it to Mary and Thomas, he said to me, with the same consideration that Jonathan leaves at 10 o'clock. I waited. He had not summoned us here to tell us such. Then he went on. I have had word today of a disturbing matter regarding the prisoners in Salem Prison. My mouth went dry. I heard Mary utter a suppressed sob. Had something happened to mother? But Joseph held his hand and shook his head, allaying our fears. Your mother is well, but they have put chains on the prisoners. When Sir William heard that these shapes of the accused witches are still flying about the countryside afflicting the girls, he ordered chains. Mary threw her arms around me and began to weep. I held her and stood strong. Mama in chains? How could I bear it? Joseph came to us and put one hand on Mary's head and the other on my shoulder. There now, girls, the news is not all bad. When your father heard of this in Boston, he made ready to come back to Salem and turn himself in. He has been working all this time to have your mother removed to Boston. He returns in hopes of making things easier for her. He is prepared to face charges. Mary's crying intensified. What will happen to him when he returns? She wailed. He will be examined, but because of his position, he and your mother will be allowed their liberties in Boston, returning to Arnold's jail only at night. You've been helping him, haven't you, Joseph? I said. We are much beholden to you. I am working for many others also, he smiled. You girls must have some sensible of that. I wanted to prepare you both this evening for the fact that your father may be knocking at our door any night now. I wanted you to be ready to receive him. Mary, you're to go with your parents to Boston, I understand. Is that so? Mary wiped her eyes. Yes, sir. Susanna, as I understand it, your mother said you may stay with us. We are happy to have you. But are you sure this is what you want to do, child? Yes, sir, if you'll have me. He nodded solemnly. We're glad to have you. Now go and help your sister pack her things.